Welcome to Introduction to Theater Drama 1310. The first slide of this PowerPoint, like the rest of your PowerPoints, will be an introductory slide that has your key concepts for the unit. The key concepts for this unit is that theater is one of the oldest art forms. We will discuss uniqueness of theater as compared to other forms, elements of theater, functions of theater, and the theatrical contract. Theater is one of the oldest art forms. Historians know that it begins as ritual. We know that societies used ritual as a way to communicate, uh, to communicate with each other, and to the gods. We can trace the need in early societies to relieve a sense of otherness to this ritual. We refer to this need to relieve otherness to the mimetic instinct or imitation of human action. In other words, communities used ritualized communication um, as a way to talk about their lives, to explore their ideas, again, to not feel so alone, and to communicate with their gods. Most of these rituals were done on a quarterly, seasonally, yearly basis. They were sometimes nonverbal reenactments, meaning dancing, uh, burning of incense, sacrifices. Eventually, they, are, they, are, they evolve and are standardized into formalized ritual with special chants, singing, etc. Eventually, this ritualistic performance becomes split between the community members and those which are a part of the ritual. So you have audience and you have performers. This performance of ritual is in every culture. Every culture, east or west, has an origin story. It's ritualistic beginnings and how that turns into theater. We're really fortunate because the beginnings of our ritualistic theater are the Greeks. Uh, like all of our Western history, everything begins with the Greeks. You can see in the beginnings of Greek theater the ritualistic ideas that I just talked about and how the ritual becomes step by step a standardized, formalized form of performance that leads to the kind of theater that we have today. So the Greek theater uh, starts with a ritual called dithyrambic odes. Odes are like prayers, hymns, chants. Uh, they're to the god Dionysus. These odes were, again, very ritualistic in nature. There were 50 men. They would be considered priests. They would encircle an altar. On this altar, there would, they would burn sacrifices, incense, etc. And as they're burning, they're chanting. The community would stand around the chanters of the dithyrambic odes. Eventually, it is believed that they added some kind of movement with the chants, and then they began to wear specific costumes, masks. I have here the image of a Greek mask. Uh, they continued for a couple of centuries chanting and being a part of this dithyrambic odes. The ritualistic nature involves and the whole community is watching. Eventually, and this is where we take major steps toward what we recognize as theater, um, the odes are written down. And when they're written down, there are playwrights who eventually 
slowly change those dithyrambic odes into what we recognize as plays. Uh, this happens as a step-by-step -step process. And Thespis is the, the writer slash actor who wrote the first dithyrambic ode that had a member, a priest of the chorus, step away from that chorus and speak a line of the dithyrambic ode alone. The rest of the chorus responded. Then he spoke alone. They responded. And what we have here is dialogue. Eventually, over many years, they whittle down that chorus to 25. And there is another ode that is written where they have Thespis plus another actor who are saying lines of those odes and have a chorus there to respond to them. Eventually that chorus becomes only 12. Plus, they begin to line up on one side of the altar with the rest of the community facing the altar. So now you have the step of audience, performers, you have two characters and a chorus that are exchanging dialogue and slowly they begin to write odes that resemble plays where we have a narrative with story and a plot and the actors are a part of the chorus as well as three others that have stepped away from the chorus. So that's how it evolves from the ritualistic beginnings of chanting and singing and surrounding the altar and eventually becomes three actors, a smaller chorus of 12, standing on one side of the altar while the community audience is on the opposite side of the altar and it evolves into a story and plot. And what stories do they go to? They go to their stories of their religion. Greek mythology is the religion of the time and of Greek theater. Now keep in mind that Greek theater is Greek religion. So the people who were involved with this were held in high stature in the community. Uh, they were considered what we would consider uh, them to be priests. So now we can see theater as it will be for the next several centuries. We have actors, uh, the chorus, although there are 12, uh, they function as another character on stage. So we have a narrative structure, the mythology, the stories of the Greeks, um, the themes and ideas are now a part of the narrative structure. We don't just have chants and singing. Once you have characters, once you're imitating the life of human beings and their gods, you can now explore themes and ideas, the fundamental aspects of humanity. Um, it's an understanding of what makes drama work that we see at play here too. Many Greek plays um, are still popular now from hundreds of years ago because they do continue to use the same ideas and themes that we use in our plays today. And the Greeks had a wonderful idea about what audiences want. Audiences want to watch something with a sense of anticipation. They want to know what's going to happen next. So Greek plays often have characters who are tackling life, big ideas, and there's always a lot of conflict. All good plays and drama also has conflict. Uh, the Greeks understood their audience. They knew that their audience was familiar with the content. They knew that they b knew the basic story. So they were able, through dramatic structure, to tell the story in a way that was slightly different than anybody had heard it or seen it before. Um, and that's a great use of anticipation 
and conflict. And remember, theater is a part of Greek religious life. Um, they held these plays in great importance. They went to them often. Uh, they were a part of their lives on a really important basis. Uh, this was not just for entertainment. This was not just an idle um, activity. Okay, let's move on to our next key concept, the elements of theater. Okay, I think most of you know something about theater or a play, so let's start with the basics. First, you have an idea. The playwright has an idea, creates characters, plot, etc., uh, writes it all down. Now, think of this as a blueprint because it is really the interpreters that take all of that information that is in the script and bring it to life. Um, again, the interpreters are the artists who bring the script to life. See these side notes here. Interpreters, that is the director, the person who leads everyone in this artistic endeavor. Uh, they make the decisions about uh, the concept, the look. They also coach the actors. We will go into detail about what a director does later in the semester. The performers are also interpreters of the playwright's idea, the playwright's work. That's the actors, singers, dancers, puppeteers, everyone involved in that production who is a performer. They work with the director. Now the design aspects are the, the interpretive artists that I think sometimes get forgotten. These are the people who are designing and creating the sets, lights, costumes. Um, they interpret what the playwright has created. They do so being led by the director. We also have as an element of theater, theater spaces. Theater spaces means the physical structures the plays are performed in. You know, I've already talked about the Greeks a bit. Um, and on the next slide, I actually have a, an image of a Greek theater. Um, they built huge theaters for their plays. And that changes over time. Um, how much effort is put into theater structures, if it's permanent, if it's not a permanent theater structure. Um, we have today many different types of theater spaces. So we will spend a great deal of time talking about those different physical structures. Also, and I have it here as the last thing, but it's actually the most important thing. Uh, the element of the audience is all important. Without the audience, there's no reason for us to have theater. Um, we're not just doing theater for ourselves. Uh, we are doing it for an audience. Um, and they're the most important part. And yes, the audience is a part of the theater. Keep that in mind as we talk about um, later the theater contract. So here's that image of a Greek theater. Um, this image is modern. The little people that are standing on the circular part of this theater are actually human beings, little people. Um, they look small because the theaters are huge. They seat thousands. Um, okay, so other essential elements. For theater to survive, we must consider some practical things. You know, I've been talking about the basics and uh, theater in, you know, kind of esoteric terms, but it, theater is an art form that survives by the box office. In other words, if we were going to form our own theater this semester, we would have to consider some other things. Uh, I want to talk about it here because I won't talk about it as much throughout the semester. But I don't want you to forget that theater does not uh, succeed, it doesn't last in a society that where people don't have enough leisure time, free time, to actually go see plays. Um, you know, there's a big difference between 
Lufkin, and Nacogdoches. Nacogdoches has a thriving community theater. Uh, Lufkin has the Angelina Community Theater, and it is new. It's still struggling. I think it's going to survive. But the reason I think that Nacogdoches still has a great community theater is because of the university. They have a population in Nacogdoches that has a white collar nine to five existence. They have the leisure time to go and see plays. And because they have that leisure time, they're looking for things to fill it and fun things to do. The reality is, is that the community of Lufkin is populated more by blue collar shift workers, hardworking people who don't always have the time to go and see a play. Um, and you know what? They don't always have the resources. Theater survives by the box office. Now, we're not like the movies. You don't pay, and that money goes to the people who um, are footing the bill for the, the big blockbuster movies. We don't make millions. Generally, when you go see a play in a regional community theater, uh, that ticket is going to pay the cost for what you're seeing on theater, on stage, in that theater, uh, right then. Uh, again, really expensive tickets, big, huge shows, um, they're not over the entire, opening over the entire United States because of resources. People don't want to pay the $150 you would pay for a Broadway ticket. Now, when they do go to Broadway, they feel like that $150 is put to good use when they see the extravagant technical elements that Broadway theater has. Most theater in the United States is a lot smaller scale and survives on a much smaller budget. But a community still has to have enough money to buy those tickets. Always remember safety. People won't go see a play if they think it's in a building or a part of town that's not safe. Um, sometimes towns want to renovate an old warehouse or an older building. And again, a community will not support that theater if they don't have a safe place to park their car or they don't feel like they can exit safely in an emergency. That's something that we have to constantly be aware of. Again, these are very down-to-earth things. Um, a sense of community. You know, I should say need to communicate before I say a sense of community because if it wasn't for this, the human need to communicate, no theater would exist at all because no one would care. Um, the sense of community is really important because we do have to have an audience in order to survive. So we basically want to do plays people want to see. Now, do we also want to do plays that we think have artistic merit? Do we want artistic freedom? Yes, we do as artists want all of those things. But if you focus in a theater on only doing the kind of theater you want to do, you're not going to have the resources where your audience is willing to use their leisure time to come to your theater and see your work. So that's why you need to be very aware of the sense of community. Trying to do theater with ideas and themes that might be interesting, get people to think, yet at the same time, um, they're interested in, they want to see, they're, that is entertaining. Uh, a good example of this is I love Japanese theater. I took a graduate course on Japanese theater. I would love to be able to do Japanese no theater um, and some kabuki theater because kabuki inspired the anime that's so popular right now. But you know what? These are plays that have very strict uh, sets, costumes, language, and I don't have an audience that speaks Japanese. So I'm not going to be able to survive if I continue 
to do Japanese theater or plays that my audience is not really interested in. Yet I tell you, I can do The Wizard of Oz every five years and I will pack the theater. Uh, that's what I mean by a sense of community. Again, these are other sen essential elements. I told you the basics. Those are the things that your textbook's going to cover. And you know what? Those basics in the previous slide are also our units that we're going to cover throughout the semester. But remember, theater survives by the box office. So we have to be pretty practical about the things that I have listed here. Next, the uniqueness of theater. Um, I'm going to give you a discussion question, uh, not this week, but next week, where I want you to compare television and film and theater live performance. Um, as we're discussing it, I want you to keep in mind, one of these art forms is an active art form. One of the art forms is a passive art form. Um, the most significant difference between recorded and live performances has to do with whether an art form is active or passive. So there will be more follow-up on this unique quality of theater in the future. Um, theater is very unique because it is so collaborative. In fact, it is often called the collaborative art form. Um, theater combines many art forms. We use music. We use painting, sculpture, um, we use puppetry. Like I said, many different art forms come into play when doing theater. Uh, theater artists must also work together on a collaborative level that is very different than other art forms. Um, you know, if you're a painter, you paint and you're working on your idea, your idea alone. Um, but in theater, there is, everyone's working for the same goal. And there is a director who is in charge of the look and the concept. And everyone mu must compromise. I have friends who have left theater uh, to be a part of different art forms because they didn't like compromise. They didn't want to work together at the high level of collaboration that theater artists work in. If you're looking to break theater apart to study it, I think the best way to understand is to break theater into space art and time art. I like to think of space art as art that takes up space. It is art that you can refer back to over and over again. Things like painting, sculpture, tattoos, architecture, film. This is art that you can come back to and it's going to remain the same from when the artist created it. Time art is art that only exists in the time that it's being performed. So you're looking at things like live performance, live music. Once it's recorded, it's now a space art. But when it's being performed, if it's in front of a live audience, it is a time art. Theater. Theater is a time art. Many, many times when you see performance artists and dancers, you're looking at time art. Now, in theater, we can divide it in half. And we will do so as we study. In fact, if you look at all the technical elements, that's all the space art elements, we call technical theater uh, the sets, costume, lights, makeup, all of those parts of a play that remain the same from night to night. Those are the space art elements to the theater experience. It is the performance elements those elements that change from night to night. The time art elements. Uh, that's things like the acting, uh, directing, the movement on stage, the dancing. You know, we rehearse it. We want it to be like we have rehearsed it. But human beings are human beings. 
and things slightly change. It's one of the wonderful things about live performance. It's, it's like when you go see your favorite singers, bands. You've, you've heard their recordings, but you want to go see them live to see can they really sing? Do they really dance? Do they sound like I ex as good as I expect them to sound live? Well, that's the performance elements. That's what an audience comes to see. They come to see the technical elements, the sets, the costumes, all that stuff. But let's face it, it's really the most exciting to watch the performers. Moving on. Um, functions of theater. Function, theater has function uh, primarily as entertainment, education, and to send a message uh, since its inception. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about entertainment first. And sometimes you get so wrapped up in all the functions of theater that we forget the importance of theater for relaxation to escape our everyday lives. I think that's why television and film has become so important. Um, theater reflects life. Theater reflects our ideas and emotions. Um, but also, it has been an entertainment, uh, especially since the Romans. Uh, we see a lot of Roman entertainments and Roman comedies uh, being kind of redone in a modern world. Theater has functioned as education. It is always easier to teach an idea or behavior to a society if you do so in an entertaining, fun way. Um, I think of theater education, too, as being really important as part of children's theater. Almost every children's play is designed to be bright and fun and easy to follow, but almost every children's play has an idea, a theme, uh, that they're trying to teach the children. You might have seen some children's theater when you were a kid. Certainly things uh, that are animated they come from that history of educational theater. Uh, some of that early animated SpongeBob kind of programming. We also see theater used to communicate social and political agendas. In fact, your textbook talks at length about it being used as propaganda. Um, pay attention to that. Theater can be a very important social tool. I think theater helps you prepare for life. I think by seeing plays uh, and exploring characters, ideas, themes, you can live the life of the characters without those personal consequences. I think it is um, important that we see how others feel and live, and theater is a great way to do that. Um, also, because of theater, there's theatrical theatricality around us all the time. Every commercial, every Super Bowl, every, every visual opportunity to communicate is utilized in a theatrical way today, especially because we rely so much on television and film. Even reality television cuts up its segments to create the same kind of climax that dramatic structure follows. So again, we have something from the theater around us constantly. Okay, our final uh, key concept is the theatrical contract. When you go see a play, the artists and the audience enter into an unspoken social contract. That's what I'm talking about when I speak about um, the theater contract. Like any other contract, there's obligations um, of the artist and obligations of the audience. That's what I want to go into now. The first obligation of artists 
is to appeal to our audience's sense of community. Number one, um, we want to do theater that our audience wants to see. We want our audience to be interested. Um, as theater artists, again, we're not just doing theater for other theater people. Our second obligation, we feel that we need to be doing theater that is intellectually and emotionally stimulating. You know, I just talked about functions of theater. We're very aware that we entertain so that people can relax, leave the troubles of their lives. We know that we educate. We send social messages. We feel that what we're doing as artists is very important. And we don't want you to just sit back and passively uh, be a part of the artistic experience. We want you to critically think and be intellectually and emotionally stimulated. So again, we're trying to touch our audience's sense of community and yet be intellectually and emotionally stimulating. Uh, that's why you're not going to see a whole lot of theater, a whole lot of plays that are about stupid crap, you know. Uh, <laughs> we don't do uh, theater that is like Jackass, the television show. Well, you just don't see that in the theater world because we're very focused, again, on giving our audience more. Um, okay, so, number three. We know that when our audience comes to see a play, they're going to have to believe in the world of the play. Um, I'm going to talk about that more. It's, a, it's called the suspension of disbelief. Uh, we want to aid in that suspension of disbelief. Your text talks about this as well. In order to do that, that means that uh, you should have expectation of quality. The decision by the audience to put away doubts and choose to believe in the world of the play is really important to us so we're trying to meet you we're trying to put enough stuff on stage to be as prepared to have consistent characterizations all those things of a quality play we want to provide for you so you feel like you've suspended your disbelief for a reason for example, how would you feel if you go see a science fiction movie that wants you to believe in the world of that science fiction movie, say Star Wars, and you see it and the special effects are crap and the characters really don't make sense in the Star Wars story? Um, you don't want to suspend your disbelief. You've not been given enough quality in the product to do so. In theater, number four, we also feel that we want to give you a heightened sense of life. We provide plays that often have life condensed. In other words, a lot of things happen in a play that would normally happen in the hour and a half or two hours of performance time. We call this dramatic time. In other words, we'll have a scene and we'll go forward to the next scene. Things will have happened in the world of the play, in the world of the characters, um, but we're really only showing you the interesting bits. Uh, and that's another reason why we use themes and situations that are universally interested in, um, are interesting, that our audience will want to continue to watch and be a part of because we want to give you more. Uh, we want it to be exciting. All right, so these are the obligations we feel as artists we need to give our audience because, again, we are an active art form, not a passive art form. Our audience, we're aware of you. In fact, the actors on stage are aware of you. They can hear their audience laughter. They can hear sighs of boredom and coughs or people leaving. So as an audience, that energy, you 
feed the artists on stage. It's a very, again, active art form. So, what do we expect of our audience? We only have three expectations as far as obligations of the audience. And again, you're not a passive audience. We think you're a part of our theater experience, remember? We even have you as one of our essential elements. Um, what we want is that an audience have an understanding of theatrical conventions. Now, this is an important concept of the, in the class. So I'm going to spend a little more time on this. Um, it's mentioned in your textbook as well under um, conventions. What are theatrical conventions? Um, I think the best way to think of them is that accepted falsehoods on stage. Um, when you go see a play, there are certain things that happen on stage that we know aren't real, but we accept them. For example, ghosts on stage uh, or musical theater, people breaking out into song and big song and dance numbers. We know that does not happen on, um, in our everyday lives. Yet when we see a play, it's perfectly acceptable for somebody to stop acting, stop the scene, and then break out into song. In other words, it's an unspoken agreement between the artists and the audience to believe in that fictional reality on stage. Um, sometimes it can also be accepted behavior because you are a part of the performance. Things like applause is a theatrical convention of modern times. Uh, the lights dimming before the play starts. Uh, the curtains closing. Those are all parts of our modern theatrical conventions. You know, they're different, and this is important because you're going to be doing a history project. Theatrical conventions are different throughout time. Since I've talked about the Greeks um, and ritualistic beginnings of theater, once their theater is codified, you know, they have very specific Greek theatrical conventions. So I'm going to use them as another example of Greek theatrical conventions. Um, for example, all Greek plays have a chorus. There is very specific purpose of the chorus. They are like another character on stage. They give background information. They indicate time uh, that has passed. They sometimes pray. Um, another theatrical convention of the Greeks was a three-actor rule. Remember I talked about how from the dithyrambic odes an actor stepped away from the chorus and then another actor and then a third actor they stopped at three. All Greek plays were performed by only three actors who would change their costumes, their masks and then play a different character. So the three actor rule works because of the costuming. The fact they had huge costumes and masks that covered up their physical being. They could be seen from far away. And again, that was what the Greek audience was used to. That was a part of their theater. They didn't see a bare-faced, regular-sized human on their stage they saw a person with a huge costumes and platform shoes and a mask and all of that um, allowed those three actors to play the multiple characters that are in a Greek play. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned is that the Greeks used only male actors. In fact, on the public stage, this lasts until the 17th century. Only male actors. Uh, in fact, there were only landowning males as audience members. This was very much a male-dominated society. Um, there's a lot of violence. People die in Greek plays. Uh, you certainly, when you read Oedipus, you'll notice that there's a, a violent ending, but they never show that violence on stage. 
Um, it is talked about. There is a messenger character. When you're uh, reading the play Oedipus, note that last messenger character who comes on and describes what happens in the palace to Yocasta and Oedipus. Um, it's believed that the Greeks understood that our imagination is greater than anything that they could stage. Um, also, the use of the deus ex machina. Most, well, I won't say most, a lot of Greek plays have intricate plots where the characters are in difficult situations and because the Greeks understood and audience anticipation we're waiting to see oh my god what's going to happen what are they going to do well sometimes the playwright could not logically on stage wrap up that plot so they would have a god come in and that god would wrap up the plot. Now, the name Deus Ex Machina, God from the Machine, comes from a harness that was attached to one of the three actors, and they would be raised on a crane above the stage area like a god. And then they would talk to the characters and the audience and the chorus and tell everyone, okay, you're exiled, you're going to be put to death, and they would end the play in that manner. In fact, it's a term that's still used today. A, a deus ex machina means a contrived ending today. If you're watching a play or a movie, and when it ends you think, whoa, that's very anticlimactic, that didn't really make any sense. In fact, that ending kind of came from nowhere. Well, that's um, called a deus ex machina. Uh, sometimes if you're reading movie reviews, etc., and they mention it, it means it's contrived, it doesn't flow from the rest of the plot, it doesn't fit in the reality of the play, it's coming and ending from nowhere. It seems like a cheat. Okay, our final slide about the theatrical contract is the final two things that we want our audience um, to be capable of. One, judging the merits of a play. Okay, here's a term that you will need to understand for the rest, rest of this class, kind of like um, theatrical conventions, and that is aesthetic distance. Um, an obligation of the theater audience uh, is to be objective versus subjective. You know, you're supposed to have a willing sense, suspension of disbelief. We want our audience to be empathetic, to care enough about what they're seeing on stage, but you know what, as theater people, we also want you to be intellectually stimulated and have a certain level of objectivity. Part of this class is the critiquing process. Later in the semester you're going to watch a play and you're going to write me a critique about that play. When you do so, I want you to employ some aesthetic distance. Okay, here's the definition of aesthetic distance. We need separation from a work of art in order to fully appreciate and understand that work of art. Again, we need separation from a work of art in order to completely understand and appreciate that work of art. Okay, so I have a painting here. What do, does that have to do with theater? Well, this is an impressionistic painting. The impressionistic artists who painted wanted to leave an impression on the viewer. They weren't trying to, to capture uh, with photogenic type reality what they were painting. Most of their paintings are really huge. If you go to a museum and you stand close to this painting, it really just looks like globs of paint. It doesn't look like it has much form at all. But when you attain aesthetic distance, 
a separation. You stand back, you move away, you can see the whole painting in its totality. You can tell, oh, it's a pond with water lilies and a Japanese bridge. You have attained aesthetic distance. You can now judge the merits of the painting totally. That's what we want you to do when you see a play. You know, I know when I go see plays, movies, I get real wrapped up in what I'm viewing and really excited and rooting for characters and not the other characters. And when I first leave that, um, that viewing experience, I'm still wrapped up in that world of the play. It is later when I sort of have some distance and I think back on it. I start to realize maybe some stuff that wasn't that great. Maybe now I'm noticing, you know what, those special effects, they weren't that cool. Or I didn't think this actor's performance, I could see any actor playing that. Or I don't think that actor did so well. Or boy, that actor was awesome. That's what we do when we are critiquing and we are thinking about and critically thinking about what we view. We just need a little aesthetic distance so that we can be objective in order to take it apart. All right, the third and final obligation of the theater audience is to remember, you're not in your living room. Um, have some etiquette. You know, I think it's easy to forget because we spend so much time watching stuff in loud movie theaters and at home that you have people who are sitting around you that can really hear if you're whispering, you're coughing. Um, we don't allow f food in our theater. Uh, it's not that kind of environment. Unless the actors and performers invite you to, we don't really want our audience to talk to the actors on stage. We want you to respect the actors on stage and remember, you can be a huge distraction because they can hear you. This isn't like television and film uh, where the performances are done, recorded, you can't change them at all. Um, so again, Okay, so I'm going to tell you an example. I talk about etiquette, remembering you're not in your living room, being nice to one another, etc. But one of the funniest things that ever happened in the theater to me is when we did a, a play called Wait Until Dark. In fact, I'm going to do that play again soon. Um, but in the play, there's a murderer who's been hiding in a room where a blind woman lives and I'm shortening this quite a bit, she eventually realizes she's not alone, that there's someone hiding in that room with her. Well, the audience, of course, they know he's there, they can see him, but she, because she is blind, cannot. So you see her in the world of the play go around breaking out every light bulb that's in that room, in that apartment, so that the other character, the murderer character, can't see her in the world of the play. She's leveling the playing field. But she forgets one light bulb. She walks over to the, I'm sorry, the murderer walks over to the refrigerator. He opens the door and that light floods the stage and her. Now he can see her. He walks up and opens his switchblade knife. He's bringing his arm around her, and a woman in the audience yells, Be careful! He's right behind you! Okay, so the audience laughed a lot. It was really funny. She got very wrapped up in the world of the play. Um, the, uh, the actors, I was very proud of them, they paused. They waited for the laughter to go down, and then they continued with the play. Um, that was a great moment, but by and large, we would really like for you guys um, to listen, uh, enjoy, but don't interrupt.